This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Here we are at the end of 2016 and also the end of the Flames' six-game winning streak. And this has been a, an up-and-down week for the Calgary Flames. But as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to break it down for you. Matt, overall thoughts on the four games the Flames played this week? Well, that short break that the team had ended up causing a few hiccups in the team. They played two excellent teams in Columbus and San Jose and were thoroughly beaten by each of them 4-1. to one. And they had one bad game against Tampa Bay and they beat Arizona. So it's been an up and down week, but not much you can do with the teams that you're playing. Well, why don't we break it all down and let's start with that game you are mentioning against Tampa Bay and... This was a game I thought the Flames should not have lost. If you took a look at this game, Tampa really came out looking flat. They weren't playing their offensive game. They weren't playing great really on either end of the ice. But uh, I think after the uh, the power play goal by Brian Boyle in the first, the Flames just kind of got deflated. And they they just let things go in this one. Like I guess that's the best way to say it is they just kind of collapsed. It was like the Flames team we saw last year. They'd get behind and just fall apart. Yeah, it almost it's like they were overconfident because of the amount of injuries that the team had heading into the game, like Kucherov and Stamkos weren't playing. And it's like, especially with the early power play goal by Troy Brower, it's like, oh, well, we've got this one in the bag. We'll just walk all over these guys because, you know, their best players are all out with injury and you know, we don't need to try too hard, and then what happened happened, and it ended up getting up to 5-1, and yeah, that's the ball game. Yeah, it was, it was one of those things, I think, where by the time the Flames realized how far down they were and started to pull things back, they were just too far in the weeds, and the the lightning had kind of taken control of things by that point. I was really glad to see TJ Brody score in the third, even though it was kind of too little too late. Um, it wasn't a pretty goal, but that's one of those goals where, you know, you'll just take whatever you can get at that point. Yeah. And with his off season and the start to his year, just getting something going will do nothing but help him moving forward. Yeah, and there's really, I mean, if you look at this game, there's really not a stat that the Flames win in besides hits, and I think that's indicative of the whole game. Like, these guys just didn't play well after the three days off. I think they probably needed the time, but it just didn't help. Yeah, and Chad Johnson played rather poorly in this game. Actually, he played rather poorly in each of his starts this week. The second game the Flames played, they took on an NHL powerhouse. This is not something I thought I'd see in an NHL powerhouse in the Columbus Blue Jackets, but this is a team that's gotten quite a bit better over the last couple seasons, and they're one of the top teams in the league right now. Uh, the Flames lost this one 4-1, to one, and this was a game where I think that the Blue Jackets came out knowing what their game was. They played a very defensive game. They made the Flames really work for all the shots they got. And the Jackets did a great job, I thought, of clogging up the Flames' shooting lanes all night. Like, they just they didn't let the Flames get much off in the offensive zone, and you could tell the Flames getting frustrated by that. Yeah, and even the last time that these two teams faced off against each other, I felt that Columbus should have won that game, and if it wasn't for Chad Johnson standing on his head, they likely would have. They're a surprisingly good team, and I don't think many people would have pegged them to be quite as good as they are, but when you've got a guy like Zach Wierenski coming out of nowhere to be one of the top offensive defensemen in the NHL, that certainly helps matters. So, And Sergei Bobrovsky is playing more like himself with each passing game. And, you know, I think that this game, there were 
unlike the Tampa Bay game, I think more pros for the Flames, even though we lost. I thought the Flames had a really good power play in this one. We really got to see, uh, you know, the Monaghan goal was a power play goal, but they, they played pretty well with the man advantage all game. Um, we saw a better Chris Versteeg than I think we've seen in a while. We saw really what a good passer and playmaker this guy is. And I also thought that Yoki Paka looked a lot better tonight. He looked like he was really at the top of his game. He's kind of been so-so all season. But really, I think if we look at what really caused this one to not go the Flames' way is they had a good third period, but they, they had a terrible second period, and it let the Je- the uh, Blue Jackets really take advantage. And as you were saying, they ran into Bobrovsky, who was really hot, and I think that was the biggest downside here. And that happens. Like Any time any team plays against the elites in the NHL, and I don't think anybody would have thought Columbus would be among them, but it's going to be hard to collect two points. And usually teams only win like 40% of the games against the upper echelon teams just because they're good. And you have to kind of catch them on an off night in order to collect two points. And Columbus was not having an off night, and they won. And... Thankfully, the Flames moving forward don't have too many more games against teams like Columbus for at least the next little while. Hopefully it lets them regain some footing in the standings. So after those two games at home, the Flames went on the road. They went for a bit of a uh, a sunny trip. And first they ended up in Arizona where they took on the Coyotes. And as we've seen so far, the Coyotes gave them a pretty good fight, as we usually see. But... The Flames extended their winning streak this season against the Coyotes to 3 nothing, taking the game 4-2. to two. I thought really in this one, uh, despite the team being a little bit shaky even strength, they really won this one because they were superb with the man advantage. They scored three times with the extra man. And the Coyotes, they got some nice bounces even strength, but the Flames just played a better overall game. What do you think? I agree. I think that Brian Elliott had a really strong game, except for the two errors that he let in. Other than that, I thought he was quite solid in net, and like the first goal, I can't really blame him. 99 times out of 100, that puck either gets rimmed around the boards or gets absorbed into the player, and the goalie's allowed to recover. It just it was a perfect bounce right on to the other guy's stick and easy, quick wraparound. And unfortunately, that does happen once in a very blue moon. And for Elliot, you know, after his season, that was pretty much the last thing that I think he was hoping for but he managed to settle down after that and recovered quite nicely and unfortunately allowed another stinker goal in the third period but and when, I mean, as, when it as mattered much as Elliot remind, let in a couple stinkers the flames still ended up winning this one which i think is the impressive thing here because yeah. i really thought it could go the other way because of some of the stuff elliot was letting in yeah, and when the game mattered, when there was that lengthy five-on-three, he shut the door. So, at least they got the two points. I think that if it was any other team than Arizona, or a similarly inept offensive team, I think that the Flames would have likely lost that game as well, with their effort, especially in the first ten minutes. But... They did manage to get a few past Mike Smith and got the win. When I look at the players on the ice during this one, I mean, the usual candidates, Goudreau, Backlund, Froley, Kachuk, Hamilton, Giordano, were all great players. But I really thought that maybe the best flame in this game was Chris Versteeg. I think that his power play goal really swung the Flames' momentum and was exactly what they needed at the right time. And he seemed to get involved everywhere he could. He was creating offense. He was playing a little bit physical like he just seemed to be all over the ice doing exactly what he needed to be doing when he needed to do it for sure and it seems that whenever he's in the lineup he's contributing in a positive manner if he's not getting hurt exactly and that's the problem is making sure that he remains healthy enough to be that secondary passing type player someone that can complement a Goudreau 
So that way you got two guys that can dish the puck equally effectively. Some interesting stats from this game. This was Elliott's first start since November 28th in Brooklyn. And this is now, at this point in the week, eight consecutive games with a power play goal for the Flames. So, I mean, for a team that at the beginning of the season we were saying had a terrible power play and terrible penalty kill, that's a heck of a turnaround by our power play. Yeah, bumped all the way up to 14th in the NHL after being so far abysmally in 30th that it would take a minor miracle to dig your way out of it, but they have done that and then some. The first time since January 11th, 2016, almost a year, that we've had three power play goals in one game, and that was a game against San Jose Sharks. Yeah, and on, on top of that, Arizona has only allowed three power play goals at home all season up until that point. So we doubled their total in one game. This game, I think we needed to see Elliott and Ned again, and we got that here. We got to see him. Chad Johnson got the night off. I still, right now, and I don't know how you think, I still think based on the body of work, even just lately, um, Johnson is still the guy that I'd be running with. I actually disagree. You I do? think that uh, Chad Johnson, in his history, he usually goes on fire for a while, and then he'll have like a stretch of really bad games, and then he'll go on fire again. And... With the Flames heading into a stretch where they're playing some inferior teams, uh, they play Vancouver three times, Colorado twice, and Arizona again on New Year's Eve. With those kind of teams, having Elliott in net for a handful of them, I think that would help him to regain his confidence. Like, he got a win. He got a point in that Brooklyn game and was quite effective despite the loss. And Elliott's looked really shaky in his last three starts. So between all of that, I think l allowing Elliott the opportunity to get the crease back in the crease again for at least like the Vancouver game, perhaps the Colorado one, and see how he responds and allow him the opportunity to try and retake his spot. And I think that, you know, if we look historically, those games between Christmas and New Year's, too, are generally pretty low-key games. Like they're, You can tell the players are in vacation mode a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, usually, well, last year and the year before, I, if I recall correctly, the team played exceptionally bad in that stretch of oh, yeah. three games. Like, I remember that Anaheim game that you and I went to last year, and it was like, uh... Am I watching NHL hockey here? <laughs> so Is this Edmonton? Hello. Yeah. So just looking back at it, last year uh, the Flames played on the 22nd. They beat the Winnipeg uh, Jets. And then on the 27th they beat, uh, it was 5-3 win over Edmonton. There was a one nothing loss to Anaheim, and L.A. beat us 4-1 to one on the New Year's Eve game. But even with those numbers, I think that it wasn't great hockey, if I remember correctly. Yeah, no. So, yeah, that's that's our our tradition from last year. Um, I, you know, I don't think the Phoenix game, the Flames played well. I just think that they played better than Phoenix. Like, I don't think that was a yeah. great Calgary Flames showing, but it's not hard to play better than Phoenix. Yeah, exactly. When you're playing a team that's second worst in the Western Conference, if you're not walking out with two points, something's wrong. <laughs> I still say Phoenix. Arizona. I know. It, it happens. It'll probably take until they actually move to Quebec for you to figure it out. <laughs> probably. Though I don't still call the Jets the Thrashers, so I don't know. We'll see. And then in the last game of the week, the Calgary Flames went from Arizona to San Jose in a back-to-back -back game where they took on the Sharks. And in this one, they lost 4-1. to one. And, Matt, I don't know about you, but to me, there's no shame in losing to one of the best teams. This was a trial for the Flames, see if they could beat one of the best teams, San Jose's at the top of the West. And to me, they fared about how I expected them to fare. What about you? Yeah, more or less. I think that they could have won that game. I thought that the goaltending from Chad Johnson let them down, especially with a couple of the goals that he surrendered. I didn't think that they were, especially the second one that he allowed that to Paul Martin I thought that was a terrible goal to allow and 
it, it, the Flames just kind of lost the, all their momentum once the second goal went in, and they just fell flat after that and allowed another two goals. That's why I think that Elliot should get a, at least a couple of shots at it just to see sort of like how two years ago the Flames would ride Hiller for a while, then when he started slowing down they'd run go with Ramo for a while and just bounce back and forth. I think Johnson's starting to slow down after his good month and now give it to Elliot, see if he can pick up the ball and run with it and go from there. Yeah, I mean this is a you know, this is a team that we played on a back to back. Back to backs generally aren't your friends. This is a team that made it deep in the playoffs last year. They're a legitimate Stanley Cup contender who is in the finals. A win would have been nice taking it to overtime would have been nice but to me this is just one of these games where stuff just kept piling up against us and we lost you know san jose had better had better um puck possession i think they had better uh, better offensive zone chances we just started to get frustrated and the penalty minutes started to pile up and i just thought that for a back-to-back and against a, a great team it was just yeah the flames just started to get frustrated yeah, and if you would have said that the Flames would have lost the games to Columbus and San Jose before we played them, like, yeah, that's about right. So it's mm-hmm. not the end of the world that they lost those two games. It's we just, beat the Sharks earlier. This one we lost. Yeah, hey, you're not going to beat good teams like San Jose f- like four or five times out of five. It's like, it, it, That would be a rare occurrence, not something that's likely to happen. And I'd like to try playing them again when we're not on a back-to-back. I think that, that probably had a lot to do with this. The team, I mean, the team kind of looked out of gas for some of the the week, and I sp- think especially in this one, they just looked like they were ready for a break. Yeah. So outside of this week, then there really hasn't been a lot more Flames news. We'll talk a little bit more about the implications of this week later on. But at this point, the sky is not falling. The Flames are not in a doomsday spot. They're right now sitting in the first wild card spot with a total right now of 36 points. LA is right behind us with 35 points. And in order to get into the top three in the Pacific, we need to beat, believe it of, of all teams, Edmonton, who has 39 points. So we're, I mean, we're still in this. You know, we had one win this week, and we're we're still in a good spot. Yep, it's one of those situations where the team will have to have a good stretch over this next week uh, or next seven games or so in order to try and bounce back and get back into that contention for the top three spots in the Pacific. Yeah, they. I think that the Flames have gone through as much coasting time as they can. Yeah. And as we usually see in January, January is going to be the month where we see what this team's made of. Yep. Um, so, Matt, let's talk quickly about some of the two notes, and then we'll do a bit of a reflection on the year. But a couple notes for Flames fans. One is that Watherspoon was recalled again. They what? They sent him to Stockton. He was down there for 48 hours, and they recalled him. And a big reason for that is that we're now in the Christmas roster freeze, and you can't recall him after that if you don't now. But I don't know. This guy needs a. This guy's nickname needs to be Yo Yo or something. Like he just keeps going up and down and up and down, and he's not getting much play time either. Yeah. Well, he's probably the best player to use in that situation because, like as we've said many a time, that we both think that this player is not going to be in the Flames organization long. I'd rather he come sit on the bench than Shillington sit on the bench. Exactly. And with Yoki Paka playing adequately, there's no urgency to bring Kulak back up to have him play. So why not? It just, I don't know. If you're you're Watherspoon, though, it's got to almost feel like being on death row. Like he's got to know this time as a flame is up. He knows when he gets recalled, he's not going to see a lot of minutes. I can't imagine what that feels like. Usually when you're called up from the AHL, you're happy, you're excited. It's like, wow, I'm going to the big show. And he probably knows he's just being brought up to fill space. Yeah. Well, if he gets an opportunity to actually play, he needs to have a really dynamite game and say that, no, I'm actually an NHL player, play me. And if he doesn't, or if he's just there, then 
he'll just resume being in the press box and that'll be that. Well, the thing I think is that's going to be hard for him if he does get to play is going to be carving out a unique niche for himself. What does he have that nobody else has, right? Um, like, what is it? What can he bring to the game where we say we have to start him and we can't start anybody else? And yeah. I, I just I don't know what he brings there. To me, he doesn't really have anything where I look at it and go, oh, wow, you know, this is – I have to have this. Yeah, he's sort of like the same mold of player as Yoki Paka where – has a little bit of everything, but not really anything that stands out as being particularly great. But the difference between him and Yoki Paka is that Yoki Paka is a little bit better in each of the categories. So, yeah, I don't really see much of a spot for him, but I wouldn't be shocked if he gets a shot, because why not? You, you might as well see if he magically figures it out, and if not, well, hey, at least you have your confirmation that he is what he is, and you can move on. Yeah, and and that's usually what we see when we talk about a player who is sort of that seventh round, or that seventh defenseman, not seventh round, but the seventh on the depth chart. You know, they're generally that that kind of player, the player who is, you know what, they're just there, and they can sort of fill some roles, but there's nothing dynamic about them, and that's why they're in that role. And I think, honestly, if if he's lucky, that's where Watherspoon's going to end up, is somebody's seventh defenseman. Not here, but I think he could end up that somewhere. Yeah. Or he'll be playing in Europe somewhere, and, yeah. so Higher than seven in Europe, probably, yep. Yeah, uh, probably be a top four defenseman in Europe, but... I wouldn't be surprised if he goes over to Europe if one day we see him playing in the Spangler Cup. Speaking of which, we have speaking, news about that. Speaking of the Spangler Cup, uh, f former Flame, I won't ask you to guess because you know it, you can see it here in our notes, but listeners, what former Flame do you think is playing in the Spangler Cup this year? Hint, it's not Nat Domnichelli. It's Mason Raymond. Raymond, as a lot of people know, signed with uh, the Anaheim Ducks. They sent him down to the AHL. I didn't know this, but he refused to report to their farm team. I think that's San Diego Gulls now. Yeah. So, so they released him. And I guess now he's been picked up by Canada for the Spangler Cup. So I think it'd be hilarious if Raymond's like the best guy in the tournament. Yeah, he probably will be. Or one of them anyway. There's very rarely too many NHL players that play in the Spangler Cup. So he should be fine. Um, and if you look at the roster, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty shallow this year. Let's put it that way. Isn't it always pretty shallow? I think a lot even of people, as a tournament. <laughs> well, I so I think a lot of people who are here in North America and watch the Spangler Cup generally watch it when we're in a lockout year, because it's the only thing to watch, and that's when they get a lot of guys that want to play, because I mean there's nothing else to play, right? But yeah, yeah. it's generally I mean when Nat Dominic Kelly's one of the featured Canadians, you know that it's a pretty shallow year. Yeah, wasn't uh, Nigel Dawes and Dustin Boyd in one of them or? something a few yeah, years ago Dustin Boyd like switched his nationality or something to be Kazakhstanian so he could play because he couldn't make Canada yeah I, bizarre I don't, I don't remember the exact story but yeah he like yeah he totally changed his um he totally changed his his nationality but anyway that gives people some of research over the holidays if they want to know more about it so Matt, since it's our last episode of 2016, uh, let's take a little bit of reflection back at this year. And by this year, we'll start, say, in September. We'll kind of cheat because that's this hockey season. Um, looking back at 2016 so far, what is what do you think you could sum up this season in one word, this half? Or one sentence if you have to. Not quite there yet. That's a good one. You you can see that the team is... There's parts that are good, like Kachuk and Bennett and like all the other decent players that are sprinkled throughout the lineup. It's just that they don't have quite enough talent in the spots that they need it in order to take that next step. Thankfully, moving forward, the team can address those needs it's just have to play some hockey between now and then 
Yeah, I think for me, my um, my word would be inconsistent. I yeah, think that we, and I think that goes hand in hand. Yeah, they're not ready, but I also didn't expect them to be ready. I mean, we got out to a good start, and I think I got more excited than I should have been about the team. But I, but I think that we, we, I expected this team to play worse than they have overall. I think, and when they go on these runs, it's exciting to see. But it's like, well, why can't we keep this up? Yeah, well, I think that's where the lack of talent in certain spots hurts the team. Like the Flames need a number four defenseman and they're shoehorning Weidman into that spot, but realistically, he's a 5-6. And I think that's hurting Brody as well. Yeah, and the Flames need a legitimate first or second line right winger. They have two third line right wingers and Alex Chase on, and then a insert fourth liner here. And that hurts because you're putting players with other guys that are better and it's not clicking as effectively as it should be so just little things and the team will address it as soon as like uh, the 10 or 12 million dollars in cap hits leave the team at the end of the year uh, that money will be reassigned to address those positions but there's not much you can do and any good team has very few holes throughout their lineup and the flames have two key ones right now and that's where some of the hiccups are yeah i mean i had said going into this season and you and i deferred a little bit on this that the flames were not a playoff team and i sort of changed my mind a little bit after the after the preseason and seeing some of the moves the flames made and how they looked but I still think, honestly, if I take a look, this team is not playoff ready yet. Is there a chance that they could sneak in? Yes. I mean, if the yeah, playoffs like were today, if the, we're I, in. yeah, like I don't see them being more than like a sixth place team at best. And yeah, like I think if they get in, it'll be because of the wild card spots and the fact that both the Central and the West or Pacific Division are kind of mediocre compared to the East. But it just depends a, a lot on the games to come. And if the Flames do struggle in January, I think you're going to start seeing the Flames look at moving out guys like Boma, like Weidman, like England. And well, just like any team, right? If you're not in the yeah. playoffs, you start to become a seller. Yeah. And like, even if they're not opting to keep Elliott or Johnson, whichever one, you'll likely see one of those guys get dealt, and Gilly is brought up for the balance. And, yeah, it, we'll see. If It depends a lot on how they do over the next month. If they tear the cover off of the ball, then they're, they'll be good and ready to go, and the Flames might even add something at the deadline like a Yarmir Yager or even a Jerome McGinley possibly, a cheap top six-ish forward and go from there. But And I think even if we make the playoffs, this I mean, let's be realistic. Okay, we might get lucky and win a round. Yeah, but it this would, is not I a, think it'd be a repeat. Stanley Cup team. Yeah, I, I think it'd be a repeat of 2014-2015 where if they get a favorable matchup like we did that year, we'll win. If not, will lose and it'll just be a good experience for the team and that's it and then you move on and yeah this team is not built to be a play a playoff team no not as of yet because they have too many holes in the lineup and like they could surprise teams but uh, you know too many ifs and maybes so looking back at 2015 you mentioned surprising teams any surprises on this roster anyone that you think has done for, let's say for the positive anyone that's maybe played better than you thought or has really come um come forward and really shown themselves as being a better player than we thought well i, I am gonna say like for me it's not much of a surprise but dougie hamilton has really emerged as the number one defenseman on the team and he is it, according to the advanced statistics the best defenseman on the team in terms of points he's the best defenseman on the team and he's looking like that premier player that i think everybody was hoping that 
when we made that acquisition that he would develop into. And I think he's coming along for me anyways faster than I expected. Yeah, and you have to remember he's only a 22, I think, so give me a break. Like, Usually defensemen don't get good until they're 25, 26, so we still have quite a ways to go before hitting that point. I think um, definitely Hamilton. I've been really impressed with him. I was a big fan when we brought him in. I also, for me, am going to add Garnet Hathaway to that list. I thought last year Hathaway was just kind of some fill-in depth, but he stayed here for a while, and I think, honestly, Hathaway is going to end up taking jobs. I think you're going to see Hathaway probably end up taking Boma's job. Uh, honestly, I think he already has, but the coaching staff is deferring to the veteran lately, and uh, he hasn't really done much. When I but... say take his job, I mean, I think you'll see Boma moved out in favor yeah. of Hathaway. Yeah, oh, so do I. And, you know, I mean, Hathaway's not a guy that when we looked at his acquisition, we said, this guy's going to be an NHL player. He's very much like that Josh Juris type, the guy who was brought in to be, you know, AHL depth and has fought his way to the top. Yeah, and that's why I don't like using draft picks on defensive-oriented players, like for forwards or even defensemen for that matter. Uh, you can always sign guys like this, and some of them – will actually develop and Hathaway has emerged as being a legitimate fourth line agitating pest type forward whether he can contribute any offense is still to be seen but he was decent in the AHL each of the last two seasons in that regard and you can always find those guys on the free market you don't need to waste draft picks on them but that is what it is. Yeah, for sure. And and those are the two that really, to me, have stood out on the positive side. Um, going to the other side, Matt, anyone that's disappointed you? Well, TJ Brody, but that's understandable. I don't think that's Brody's fault, though. I mean, if you got to lug Weidman around, you're going to look yeah. bad out there. Yeah, and not only that, but the off-ice issues with his girlfriend having MS. Like, it, it's a lot for... And it's completely understandable. Like, you, I know that a lot of fans, like, just think that... The, you know, these are hockey players, but they're people too. And when you're going through something as upsetting as that is, it's got a weigh on you. So the fact that he's been struggling is completely understandable. So it, I just hope that his girlfriend has as good of treatment as possible and hopefully the symptoms are mitigated for as long as possible. Yeah, I, just because he's got other stuff going on, I don't want to put him in that category. I think he's doing as good as can be expected based on what's going on. Um, but the guy I really want to, I would say to me, I don't want to say he's a regret, but it's been disappointing, is Troy Brower. I've been expecting more from him based on what we're paying him. And right now, I'm. it's starting to look like this could be a bad deal for the Flames long term. Eh, he's... <sighs> This is the type of player that I was kind of expecting when we got Brower. He's a third line forward, and he has yeah, but been. He's not being paid like a third line forward. That's the only thing. Well, for UFAs that can score twenty goals, he's pretty much in line with what the, those types get. And when the cap seventy million dollars, a four million dollar contract is slightly north of what the average contract is so it's yeah he is overpaid a bit for what he's brought but he's doing a decent enough job and yeah he struggled for a good portion of the season but you have to give him time and see where he goes and like if this is all that he gets and like this is all we get from him for the next four years, then he'll be overpaid by five hundred thousand to a million dollars for what he's bringing. But that's okay. Like uh, again, I'd rather be paying him four and a half than Matt Stajan three. That's true. And and if we look at it that way too, and going back to kind of some surprises, if he disappoints a little bit, I think one place where we are getting good value is Michael Froelich, and that's another guy, Froelich and Backlund, I should have included. They both surprised me this year. I didn't expect them to be having the years they've been having. Well, 
I think Frolik was just having a really bad year last year, and he's just returned to his normal. And he's usually a 40, 45 point guy. I just think that they've got him someone that he can play well with, and that's been a big part of it. He jumped around a lot on the lineup last year. Yeah, and now that he's with his doppelganger in Backland and the agitating Kachuk, it's that trio seems to be working well and hopefully that continues and if not then break it up and shift it around a bit but i can't complain with what either of them is bringing um any other kind of final thoughts as we wrap up 2016 from this half of the year that you'd want to share uh just it just everybody be patient like if this team falls off the face of the earth in the second half of the season it's not that big of a deal and if the flames are drafting in the top 10 again at least this year there's four really good right wingers in this draft in the top 10 or so so the flames will likely get one of them and if they don't fall down the standings and actually make the playoffs then hey it's been a successful season so Either way, there's so positives. It's, it's win-win either way. You just have to. Yeah. It depends how you frame it. Yeah, like it's not like guys like Gaudreau and Monahan and Kachuk and Bennett and Giordano and Hamilton have all disappeared and vanished into thin air and are looking terrible. Quite frankly, they're all looking as good as they were last year or better even. So, it. It's a rebuild. It, there's going to be growing pains, and sometimes the team sucks. It, it happened last year. But the Flames got Kachuk, and he's added a dynamic to the team. And if they struggle again and finish in a similar position, they'll add another good player. And then the Flames should be in, poised to take off from that point. Just have to wait and see. And unfortunately... It's frustrating because <laughs> you just want to get skip ahead a couple of chapters so like the team's doing awesome and kicking everybody's butt. But unfortunately, it, you have to watch some hockey that may or may not be bad <laughs> in the meantime. So Yeah, no, for sure. So with that in mind then, looking ahead to 2017, um, if, you were, if you were the Calgary Flames setting sort of a New Year's resolution – for this team what did they resolve to do differently in 2017 honestly just stay the course and the problems that the team has at the moment are structural issues that they can't really address without it costing way too much between now and the end of the season like if uh, they're in con contention for a playoff spot maybe they go out and get a Ginla or Yager I'm just thinking of right wingers that are older that might cost less. Okay. Like that's why I'm suggesting them because they'll I'm cost less. I'm pretty sure Yager's got a no movement clause. Yeah, but if the Panthers are doing terribly, I think he'd rather play in the playoffs, so he might just just opt to move. And you know, I think he might want to see if he can't get a few more teams into his resume there. So it. It just depends. Uh, like, if the Flames are doing terribly, then obviously they're going to sell off four or five players at the deadline and see what happens. But either way, like, you can't go and get a first-line right winger until the draft or free agency. You can't get a number four defenseman without overpaying until the draft or free agency. So you're pretty much just stuck making little moves between now and the end of the year and see how it goes see to me i don't think that i wouldn't resolve to make any moves i wouldn't resolve to be a playoff team i think if i'm looking at a at something these this team needs to fix i think it's their discipline i think in 2017 we need to take less penalties and we need to play smarter i wouldn't even say more offensive or more defensive just smarter hockey I've seen too many times when the Flames are still making dumb giveaways. Um, you know, they're 
they're not making the takeaways they should, and they're just taking, and I've said this almost every game, they're taking too many penalties. And to me, that would be my resolve for 2017 is stay out of the box and think the game better. Yeah, well, the main culprits for the too many penalties are Kachuk and Bennett. And to a lesser degree, no, Furlan's actually been rather disciplined. Furlan's been pretty good. Yeah, it, it, you've got two players that one's in his second full season, the other's in his first full season. It takes time to learn how to walk that edge. Like both guys do go over the edge quite frequently because they're pest type players. They they're agitators, and that is going to be part of the Flames' identity: is to be a real bunch of dirt bags that get under your skin and piss you off and we see that with Garnett Hathaway because he's that exact same mold of player and it takes a while for the guys to adjust to okay I can't take penalties like that here and finding that line so that way they can play on that line a little bit more effectively and unfortunately, that just takes time and experience, which neither of those players have in spades. Yeah, I can see that. I think that it's not just those two guys, but I just think as a yeah. team, we need to we just need to tighten things up. And when when we get frustrated, we can't just start pushing and shoving behind the net. We need to sort of know when to walk away. And I'm seeing more and more as this team goes down in games, they just they tend to just go out there and try to agitate more, I guess. And that's going to get you in, in more hot water. Yeah. Well, that is kind of what the Flames' identity is, though, so it's just trying to find that balance. Because I agree with you, we're a little bit lopsided in that balance right now, but that just takes time. Who do you think in 2017 the first Calgary Flame to be traded will be? Probably Lance Boma, just due to the fact that we have somebody that's playing better than him and teams are always looking for good third fourth line depth he's also a fairly cheap contract to move yeah and uh, what, 2. every two million is yeah a lot like easier everybody than like can yeah everybody can afford a guy like that and the flames might just end up trading him for a decent number six defenseman or something i i don't think that you'll get much for him but we'll see yeah, I'll agree with you that I think Bomo will be the first player moved in 2017. If you look at the big contracts we all want moved out, the Weidmans, the Stagens, you know, those sort of contracts are big and they're hard to move. Yeah, those are deadline day trades, if at all. So, which I, I do firmly expect if the Flames are out of it, and maybe if they're not, Weidman will get dealt um, just because offensive defensemen are always at a premium. And the Flames have Shillington, who could pretty much step in. And, yeah, the rest of them, it just, those are deadline day things, and we'll see. Who do you think the Flames lose in the expansion draft? We've thrown around a lot of names over time. I think it depends. If the Flames opt to leave Troy Brower open, I think he would go. If not, I think Matt Stajan will. And alternatively, if... Las Vegas just opts to sign Derek England, which would make sense, then the Flames wouldn't lose anybody in the expansion draft. Okay, so here's the thing I've thought about with that. And for those that don't know, there's some new rules on the expansion draft that the Vegas team can talk to players who are going to be UFAs, uh, I think, like a week before the expansion draft. And if you sign one of them as a UFA, then you the team that they got signed from doesn't lose somebody in the expansion draft. Yeah, and I do believe that they have to, like, if they're wanting to sign any UFA, they have to do it at during that stretch so as to not penalize the rest of the league. So you're saying they can't sign anybody in July 1st? As, as far as I know, I think that that's what it is. Like, okay, that's their window. That. Yeah, I think that's that was... their window. Yeah, because I was thinking, okay, so if you were smart, which they have some yeah. smart hockey people over there, you just make the deal and go wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We're not going to sign until July first. Yeah, and I then think that's take why take and sign England and laugh at us. Yeah, and I think that's why they're not allowed. But I'm so, not a hundred percent sure on that. But that would make sense because 
then you just wouldn't sign anybody and just leave it until July 1st. Yeah, but at some point they've got to be, like, they can't be not allowed to sign all summer, so I'd be curious to see when they'd be allowed to sign again, because they got to fill up a whole AHL roster, too. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'll have to look that up, and I'll see if we can let everybody know for next week, because that was my first thought. It's like, well, why would why would you not just tamper and just, you know, talk to a guy like you said, England? Well, yeah, we'll give you a $3 million contract on July 1st. We're going to sign you the deal now, and we just won't fax it to the league until the 1st of July. Yeah. Then they take stage in from the Flames going, oh, we didn't sign any of your guys during this window, and then they get two, and they laugh at us. Yeah. So, yeah, that's why I want to check, because I'm just thinking it's way too easy to tamper in this case. Yeah. And uh, if they can't sign July 1st, when can they sign again? Like, you can't tell me that they only get one week to sign all summer. So we'll, we'll look into it and get back to people. Um, I'm going to say in this case, I don't think the Flames will leave Brower unprotected. I think if they want to move Brower, we would find a buyer who wants to give us something for him. I think it's either going to be state. I still think it'll be Stajan, but if it's not Stajan, I think it'll be Furland. Yeah, and that's where, like, I think the Flames may opt to keep Furland and expose Brower. It just depends on because Furland's played really well this season. I think that uh, he's getting close to the point where you actually use a spot on him. Yeah, we'll see. I'm. I just think that, and again, there's a lot of strategy that goes into this for Vegas. But I think they might need to ma- make cap floor and sign Stajan just because he's a big contract. Yeah. But we'll see what happens there. Um, but I think it'll be one of those guys. Yeah. Looking ahead to April of this year, when the NHL season wraps up, Matt, what do you see the Flames' final position in the West being? Hmm. Remember, top eight teams I, make it to gonna, the dance. I'm actually going to say. My expectation is, in terms of all 30 teams, them finishing with the 8th worst record. Okay. So, if they... it, They've been so inconsistent this year that I tend to be a little bit more pessimistic when in being honest about it. Like, I'm... They have enough talent where they could make the playoffs, but you know what I mean? Like it's... I, I just think that because of their inconsistency, when it comes to when push comes to shove, they're going to excuse my language, but they're going to crap the bed. Yeah. And... And I think we're going to look at a stretch where we go, okay, we're on a six game streak. If we win these three, we make the playoffs, and they're going to lose them. Yeah. I agree. And we'll see. I'm not expecting a ton. Uh, you know, if they finish better than that, awesome. But I'm kind of starting to pencil in Owen Tippett into our lo- lineup for next year, but that's, you know, a little premature. <laughs> so, yeah, a, a little bit. Let's, uh, l- 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 and we might get more than one of them. I mean, if we make some big deals at the deadline, we could end up with two of those right wingers. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of looking at these guys as being. 10th in the west so kind of two spots out of a playoff spot and when you're saying eighth from the bottom in the league um yeah that sounds about right i was gonna say about ninth from the bottom so yeah in that ballpark yes we're roughly at um we're roughly at about the same spot yeah and i guess that brings up the question what do you think i mean What do you think they're going to get for total points this season? (sighs) I'll go with 84. So currently, as we record this, the Flames are sitting at uh, 36 36 points. Yeah, in 35 games. So, I mean, they're at almost a point a a game clip at this rate. Yeah, one over that. So so you think they're going to get slightly better than that and go with 86 points? Yeah. I don't know. I was going to go, I mean, they always say kind of 90 to 100 gets you a playoff spot. So, yeah, I think you're about right. I was going into this, I was thinking about 85 points. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we're we're pretty much. Yeah, in that there. 84 to 87 range. Yeah, I was going to say about 80 to 86. Yeah. Um, with that, Matt, which goaltender? We've talked a lot about the two of them. <coughs> you and I are conflicting right now over who should get starts in 
in the rest of December, but which goalie do you think gets the most starts in 2017? Johnson, Elliot, Elliot, Elliot or Gillies? Elliot. You think they're going to go back to Elliot? Yeah. The reason for that is that, uh, especially if the Flames say they start playing poorly, uh, you're going to want to try and maximize an asset for the trade deadline, and Elliot is the more marketable asset. And he would be instantaneously the best goalie available on the goalie market. So And a pretty cheap rental, too, if you look at his contract. Yeah, exactly. And so you'd want it to be showcasing him as much as possible, and, and that'll just rack up most of the starts between now and the deadline if the team struggles. I'm going to agree with you there. I think that, as you mentioned earlier, Johnson's hot right now. I don't think he's going to stay hot. Um, I don't necessarily think Elliott's back next year, but I think for the remainder of this season, I think that Elliott's going to get the most starts. I think when you start to panic, you go with what's proven. And right now, Elliott's what's proven. Yep. And Not in this season, but overall, Elliott yeah. has a better track record. Yeah. And we'll figure out the goaltending situation next year. When basically. we get there. Yeah. It's too hard to say which guy is better right now. We'll see. And one last prediction for 2017. This is a fun one. Um, if we talk, to, if we look up north to our friends in Edmonton, do you think that the Oilers will finally make the postseason? No. The team who hasn't lost a postseason game since 2006. Yeah, I. Yeah, no. I. They had a very easy start to their schedule, and when they are playing weaker teams like tonight against Arizona, they're beating them. But when they're playing good teams, they get it handed to them and they fallen back like they were well out in front in our division for a long time but now are in third and are precariously closing in on falling out of the playoffs entirely they don't have the depth to do it and like a guy like mcdavid he's great that's awesome but you need the secondary guys guys like backland and Frolik and brower the solid middle six guys and Edmonton simply doesn't have those and it when you have just star players and nothing else you get Calgary from like 2009 2010 where it was a Ginla and yeah <laughs> so I think Edmonton's definitely on the on an upswing. I'm seeing yeah. a lot of promising things Oh, yeah, things they're there. better. Yeah, they're a lot better. And, and they I will said be it, Torelli was going to turn the team around, but it's going to take a couple years. He has a big mess to clean up. Yeah, and like I, I'm expecting Ryan Nugent Hopkins and Jordan Eberle to get traded at some point just to free up the cap space um, and likely to get some sort of defensive help somewhere. But... Uh, that they need to get those secondary quality players in their organization, and they just simply don't have them right at the moment. What I think is kind of cool, though, is I think Calgary and Edmonton are going to kind of explode at the same time, and I'm really looking forward to some really good postseason Battle of Alberta's again. If they ever make the playoffs. <laughs> well, I, I think Calgary will get there first, but I think that you know if we kind of look at maybe two, three years from now, Calgary becomes a, a real postseason contender. Maybe four years, five years from now, Edmonton becomes a postseason contender. I think that we're going to see them both in that role at the same time. They're on their way up. Yeah. Which we can't save from the past. Now, I got another question to ask sure. you. When McDavid's contract is up, how much money do you think he'll make a season? Whatever the <laughs> maximum allowed by the CBA is. Yeah. Right now, I, it's I, like 15% I, of your total salary cap can go to one guy. I think it's 20. So, okay. I yeah. I think the max is like 14 million or 15 million. I also wouldn't be surprised if at some point we see some sort of McDavid exception in the CBA where there's almost some, the owners lobby hard for some sort of exception to get that number down. Yeah. It's sort of like if you look back at some of the CBAs, they've done rollbacks. Yeah. And I can see well, them like signing them to a big deal and then getting it rolled back. Yeah. Uh, you're starting to see the higher dollar contracts like with Kane and Taves. Fortunately for certain teams, uh, the other guys like Crosby and that got signed to lengthy deals before 
the cap got so high, so... Uh, I, I honestly see McDavid getting $13, $14 million for max term. Yeah, I was going to say 10 Yeah. I think 13 14 might be rich if you're trying to build a team around him. Yeah, well, he's not... He's never really exactly shown that he's been particularly happy about playing for Edmonton. Like, we all remember what the draft lottery and his reaction when Edmonton won it, <laughs> so... But, I mean, who's going to stand up and cheer when Edmonton, you know, gets your name? Yeah, true, but I think that he's not going to give a hometown discount at all, and I think a $10 million contract is a hometown discount, which is shocking, but... I think it is right now, but again, I think there will be some CBA provisions that might not let us go higher than that. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I also, I, I mean, we can have this discussion another time as we get close to the CBA, but I think in the next CBA we see the return of the player option, team option. That's also possible. And that could do some of it too. Um, anything else about 2017 you want to predict or look ahead to? Well, I'm just looking forward to this off season where the Flames will be able to properly address the right wing and defensive positions come on man it's december 21st you're looking forward to the off season already i'm a long-term planner type person so i look forward to seeing how this team emerges over the years so like i was already looking at this point where we are now like three years ago all right so. we'll tell you what <laughs> i'll find someone else to do the show with me for the rest of the year we'll call you when it's april <laughs> um so it's the 21st of December now, and I guess if we're not going to look ahead to 2017, then why don't we look at the rest of this year as we look ahead at the final four games of the calendar year for the Flames. Um, before we do, looking back at last at last week, we had eight points on the table, and you and I were, were both wrong, but you continued your streak, unlike the Flames. I thought the Flames would get six of those points. They'd win everything but San Jose, and I was wrong. You went with the you as usual, went with six points, and the Flames got two, the inverse of what you picked. You thought they'd beat everybody but Columbus. Yeah. Well, so. this team seems to be doing exactly the opposite of what I'm saying, so I'm going to go with two points this week, and we're going to beat Anaheim. So, so. the four games on the table is uh, here at the Dome on the 23rd against the Vancouver Canucks, 7 p.m., the Flames get their Christmas break, and they come back on the 27th in Colorado. Then they're back at home on the 29th against the Anaheim Ducks at 7, and the 31st, our New Year's Eve game against the Coyotes. If you're looking for last-minute tickets for Flames fans or last-minute gift idea, go to our friends at Tick Ticks. They're your mobile ticket exchange. They verify your buyers. They make sure they're real season ticket holders, and you can get some pretty good price tickets. So if you're looking for that last-minute gift for a Flames fan, buy them some tickets to either the Vancouver, the Anaheim, or the Arizona game. And additionally, they're coming out with a 2.0 version of their app. They just sent an email out today, so that will be something that will be coming out in the next couple of days, so you'll have to download the new app for them, so that way you can... It'll be a better interface, apparently. And if you're a seller looking to unload some tickets, maybe you're going away for the holidays, or you've got New Year's plans... Put your tickets on Tick Ticks. They they're really good for sellers. They've got good good rates. You don't have to pay any commission as a seller to Tick Ticks, and um, it's a good interface. Matt's used it a few times for his own tickets. Yeah, I haven't been able to go to many games this month, so and I've been using their system, and it's excellent. It's quite efficient. No fuss, no muss. It's just and everything's you list digital. It. No yeah. meeting people in weird parking lots or anything like that. Yeah. It, you transfer your tickets to Tick Ticks, they sell it, they transfer it to the person, they give you the money, and it's all good. So we want to thank them again for their support in 2016. They've really helped to keep Fireside Chat going and to help us expand some of the things that we've been working on. Uh, so Matt, you said you think the only win this week is two points against Anaheim? Yeah, so I'm expecting the exact opposite, but I'll run with that. So you're expecting six points. You're expecting they'll win everything but Anaheim. Yep. Even though we're not playing at the Honda Center. Well, I gotta be crafty, you know. They seem right. to be doing the exact opposite of what I say, so let's work that to my, our advantage. <laughs> True. All right, well, let's see if you can keep that streak alive then of them doing the opposite. I'm gonna go... Um, 
I'm going to go right down the middle this week. There's eight points, four games. I'm going to, I think they're going to win two games. I think they better win the Colorado game. Uh, Colorado is, I think, the worst team in the league right now. And I think that they're going to go 4-0 in the season series against Arizona and win the New Year's Eve game. So I'm thinking four points, two against Colorado, two against Arizona. Uh-huh. I said it right for once. I didn't call them Phoenix. Yay. <laughs> By the end of 2016, I'll get it right. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go with four points. So we'll see what happens. So anything else you want to talk about as we close out 2016, Matt? No, I just want to wish all our listeners a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year's uh, and or whatever you celebrate. And thank you for listening once again. And I hope you have a great start to 2017. Enjoy your holiday break. Be safe. Don't drink and drive. And we will see you guys all back here in early January. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat. And to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.